I'm Tom Ray from the band Lorenzo's Music, and you're listening to the Lorenzo's Music Podcast. When I set out to meet more musicians and learn more about what they do, one person that contacted me was an electronica musician from England. We had originally recorded our interview in the fall of last year, but if you've been listening to the show, you'll remember that somehow I accidentally lost or deleted the file or something. So we got online and recorded another interview. She releases music under the name Cyberwaste, and I talked to her about her new album, her music promotional company called Trial and Error, and another musical project that she has called Rose Astronaut. When did that band start? It came from another musical project I was doing, and it kind of got to the point with it, and I thought, it's not really doing anything. It's not going to any places in particular. It's just a bit like too many old songs. And you know when you write songs for ages and ages and they all just go a bit, oh, that's a bit naff. I can't have that anymore. And a lot of the old stuff I did with Codex, that was, it was just lots of trial and error and lots of kind of testing out how to create a song, how to make it sound okay, and just sort of getting to grips with technology and how to do um, music making to begin with. And then I sort of thought, yeah, it was a bit of a one day situation. I was like, no, I need to kind of get all of the <laughs> the newer stuff together to a good point and then make something new with it so I can kind of make fresh files and new fan base and things like that. What's the instrumentation that you use? Just mainly keyboards and lots of like just using samples, manipulating samples. And then I do kind of like field recordings of trains mostly, lots and lots of trains. Always trains. Why trains? Anyway, good rhythms. Yeah. Oh, really? That, that, yeah. It's so it's obvious. I mean, that's true. I agree. You <laughs> you hear a train go by, it's like duga 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 duga. Yeah, it's just very very manipulated in that mix. There. <laughs> You're on a bunch of different sites, uh, musically, <laughs> and and one of them is the uh, Syndical Music. Yes. What is that? It's it's it says that it's a record label and there's a bunch of different people on it. So how did you get involved in that and what is it? Ah, once upon a time. Here we go. Every good story starts with once upon a time. <laughs> <laughs> I was um on Facebook talking just randomly to somebody I know, and this guy called Charlie popped up and he was messaging on the same Facebook thread that I was on. And suddenly we decided talking off on a tangent about Nine Inch Nails, as it was. So it's kind of one of those things where I started photographing him for old, like, promo pictures and things like that. You and started photographing him? Yeah, so photographing the the guy behind Syndicole okay. in his band. And, yeah, so it came from, like, the art background. I, I guess so I didn't photograph- realize that you did photography. Yeah. Oh, okay. There's one thing. I try and do a bit of everything. Oh, okay. Nice. All right. All right. Continue. <laughs> so, yeah, I started photographing his band back in the day. And then, yeah, we just sort of stayed friends throughout all of the years and years and years. And then 2017, he said, oh, would you like to be signed? And I'm thinking, yes, mm. absolutely. One thousand million percent please sign me up what benefits does their label actually do for you i'm curious i've never i've I've never really been on a label before um from my point of view it's a lot of sort of like they have to put up with me asking a lot of questions and going (laughs) what does this mean what's this it's even like the smaller things like coming along to the gigs we're like oh great i've got like support from people who are on the label who are friends of the label and other things like that so it's a good networking kind of thing um, lots of contacts really and sort of getting the promotion side of things done and then when the single comes out which is very exciting which is coming out I'm just looking at my calendar next week yeah <laughs> very excited um, so use things like that it's like promoting it and just distributing and things like that so it's really cool yeah the uh do they help you with touring too do they have set up shows for you or is it really just kind of uh they have set up shows, yeah they are okay so tell me about that how are how it is uh, do you go with a lot of the bands that are on the label i'm assuming or is it they set you out and you play with local bands what how does that work i did do a show in september last year where it was quite a few of the bands that are on the label and again like the ones who cross over so it's members of 
some of the bands who are on the record label have also sort of crossed over and you kind of yeah we all sort of mix and match a little bit at that point but yeah it was, it was quite cool to do a showcase with um the guys from those bands because you think oh wow this is like a actually we're all meeting it's almost like a work outing so <laughs> <laughs> but, <yeah. laughs> We're like you're all back at the office going i can't wait till we get out and play a show <laughs> yeah <laughs> well we're all like signed up to full-time jobs so we kind of have to go when can, when is anyone free oh sort of maybe on that weekend no we're doing something so oh yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> how many people do you play out with when you when you do live shows well, i mean really? when you're performing it's just you oh yeah, yeah. Most oh. of the time, yeah. <laughs> okay, I wasn't sure, like, because you made me think of that when you're like, uh, when you're playing out with the bands, you have to see who's free, and it's even worse when you're in a band because then you have to see who in the band is free on top of that. So I wasn't, I wasn't sure if that was another factor on top of it altogether. I know it's quite easy. I can just go, yeah, I can do that day. <laughs> okay, is anyone else available? Is like the visual guy I work with available? Yes. Okay, awesome. We'll have your visuals today, or we'll have these visuals and things like that it's what's cool. your visuals so what's your setup like like instrument wise and also clearly you have visuals so what's what is that setup <laughs> um, i'm working with a guy called raul at the moment and his visual setup is kind of a he uses tapes and instead of like an actual video sample so he has physical vhs tapes oh neat. mixes them up and then makes graphics on top of it it's really really cool and yeah and I'm just a really basic setup because it's uh, it's it's a tricky thing to kind of decompartment all of the different pieces of the music in one go of doing it like a fully live setup. But that would be amazing to do in the future, mm -hmm. sort of dissecting it a little bit and having drum pads and having a sampler as well as those drum pads. But that's all. So when you do these live shows, how do you promote them? Like, I know the label's involved, but I mean, what what are you doing to advertise the shows? Are you getting flyers out? Are you actually going out of town? Are they tours or are they local? A lot of them are local. So I'm kind of on Facebook. You've probably seen the hundreds of millions of posts on Instagram. Where I'm like, please look at this Instagram post. It looks really cool. Yeah. Please come to a show and buy things. There's <laughs> nothing to buy right now, but buy the things when they're available. So a lot of it is social media end of things because that's where most people look now. And yeah, there's a big push to not have flyers everywhere as it is quite bad for the environment. So yeah, a lot of social media side of things i wavered off of flyers for a little while it's kind of a strange i'm just so used to doing it i mean personally i'm happy that i don't have to go out and do the tape the flyers to the telephone poles or whatever you're gonna put them on or find shops to put them in that was always uh, annoying but at the same time when you don't do it it just feels weird you feel like is anybody gonna come i don't know yeah sort of where people live and things like that and then the timing because you get a lot of I suppose it's just the curse of social media. But, oh, yeah, that was great. I support that. I don't know. I'm just very old school like that. You want to do a lot of face-to-face -face contact because you can really explain something. Oh, absolutely. And, yeah, it, it all depends, again, on people, location, time of year. You have a certain budget and you either spend horribly now, you either spend it all on sort of like Facebook posts or you spend it on paper-based things and you have to sort of weigh up yeah where the things are not to say that i don't have flyers around the place that are from gigs and i'm like oh that was an amazing gig that was great seeing that band and seeing having a poster for it and stuff like that because you go oh yeah and then that band played and they played mm -hmm. in a great set and you actually remember it more <laughs> and there's a difference between the bands that make their yeah. own and the venues that make them those are a lot more fun to have like there used to be a site called gig posters and that's what people would do is they would make their own posters for bands that were playing out that they liked. It was kind of like, it's not around anymore. The site got hacked and the guy was just like, no. I know it was a great site. And it was actually really good for going there for poster ideas. It was people posting things they did like, Oh, like spoon is playing in our town. And I created this poster for it and they'd show it to people. It was kind of a display, but it was in that format and it was really cool. Um, I forget my, what my point was, but <laughs> 
<laughs> I, I just started talking about gig posters and got all nostalgic for it. But they're great. They're lovely bits of artwork, even if it's just like a little collage. It's still fun to have a poster for something. It's yes. Nice. They do have a Facebook group if you want to check it out. And it's called mm. Gig Posters. And it's okay. But it's not it's not nearly oh, as good no. as yeah. Or what you could do is see if it's on uh the Wayback Machine on uh Internet Archive. That you might be able to see some of the old posts there. Oh. Maybe. I don't know. I've never checked that out. I just thought of that. Anyway, okay. You also do videos. How are you making those? A lot of the time it's like floating images or kind of electric light sort of things. So do you make those or does someone make those yeah. for you? Okay. Yeah. So what's the inspiration behind those? From sort of like the media background I've got going on, really. So started off with learning how to use Adobe and uh, Premiere Pro and stuff like that in college. And then sort of just carrying it on after spending all that time learning, <laughs> really. Okay. So, yeah, from the art and design background. And then so it kind of came from having loads of pictures and kind of going, what can I do with these? Can I film like a little bit of footage? Mm-hmm. And so I did that for uni as well. Did a film degree there. And now back at uni again <laughs> for another degree. So it's all kind of... Oh, you're of, back. Yeah, it, yeah. Oh, I guess I didn't know that. Now. Yeah. Growing in skills and kind of going, how can I use these skills? Because after I left uni, I, the first time I had this huge moment of, oh, no, I haven't used my degree for anything. What can I do with this? <laughs> oh, yeah. Make videos for the things you also do. So there you go. You're still using the skills, but it's great because you can kind of help out friends who need like a video for something as well as your own videos. And... I saw the promo that you're doing for the, the release that you have coming out. How do you make that imagery? How, how are you putting that stuff together? The little blue jellyfish. That's kind of like some stock footage. Sadly, oh. I didn't go out and film some jellyfish. <laughs> okay. So that's a stock image. And then it's the artwork for the single, which I made as well. And then I just kind of had one layer for that and then another layer on top of that and then the layer for the text. So it's quite, when you look at it, it sort of just blocks all on top of each other. Single comes out, it's called Thinking, and that will be out next Friday, which is very exciting, 18th. And that one is the first song to feature, big reveal, vocals from Mr. Jake Harding. And uh, yeah, he's in a band called Gravelines as well. So they are a super busy band, all signed up as well. A bit of a, like a long one to sort of organise the album. Mm-hmm. Because before this one, I had a whole other album written, ready to go. And then I thought, this sounds awful. No. Nope. <laughs> really? Yeah, I, I did the mo- one month gap away from it. Had a little holiday and I thought, oh no, I can't do anything with that. I'm going to have to rewrite the whole thing. And then go for this one. So this is the technically should be Cyborg's second album, but huh. we'll forget that first album. <laughs> wow, you so you really just scrapped the whole first project yeah. you were working on? Yeah, that's crazy. So you started from scratch, or you were like, I have to redo these songs, or you're like, forget those songs, they're dead to me now. Yeah. yeah, it was one of those things where I had about I normally get to about five songs, and I think, okay, there's a theme here. There's actually a theme. Song six comes along. There's no theme anymore. Yeah, my time management with projects versus what I wanted to do with them was kind of waning a little bit, and it just it just ended up sounding really rubbish. Hmm. So that like, where I hadn't put like the full energy into them. Okay. It was a bit like. Mm. So now the ten tracks, the brand new ones, very exciting, but they have been worked on and worked on, and yeah. It was quite nice to have somebody else sort of like contributing towards them. So I couldn't just go, we're scrapping all of this without having to second think. So, yeah, no, it was a really fun, awesome thing. It was kind of like throwing a lot of ideas back and forth between us. And he's kind of going, I've got these lyrics. And I'm thinking, yeah, great, because I can't write lyrics at all. I can't, <laughs> can't really sing and things like that. Yeah. So he went very to town with it. And I remember the first time I heard his vocals on the track and they just changed completely. They just sort of went from being, yeah, that's a great song, to, okay, this has stepped up that extra level. This is like making them sound more immersive and more kind of like having that theme. And it was mixed and mastered by James Armstrong, who is from, he has like his own musical projects called Kronos and Slow Clinic, which is really cool. That's sort of like lots of ambient soundscapes. So having like all these other people on board has kind of, yeah, really help to sort of level out where the music's going. 
you have a thing called Trial and Error Productions. What is that? It is a promotions company based in Hampshire, and it's mainly for kind of bands who want to get gigs or get a connection going. So when I joined, there was a gig last May where I ended up meeting James, who produced the album, through the promotions company. And a little bit later on, there was like another couple of gigs I did with them. And I said to them, do you need any help with any like gig promotions? And it's all, so I ended up going from like doing the media side of things and doing like the Facebook page and just sort of dipping in and out of helping in bits and bobs to just going, yeah, we're going to do more promotions. I was thinking, oh, okay, I can get behind that. That's fine. So it sort of helps bands in the local area, helps bands outside of that local area meet people. How do you reach out to the bands and find the people or have they found you? A few people have found it because there was a compilation that came out it was sort of like the first one it was mainly people who'd played trial and error gigs before it's sort of just working with bands and even like their solo projects so it's kind of finding the right people who had also done that kind of thing and the way we reach out now is an awful lot of it is kind of on facebook so like the inbox is fast and furious and many 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 hmm. bits and bobs from bands going hey i'm available on this 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 day and we're thinking oh we need to book the book another gig and book that style of gig so there'll be kind of rock and metal stuff electronic stuff and mm -hmm. very open-minded genre wise for sure how are you setting this up or helping the people out? So it's, a, it's a real mixture of kind of people seeking us us seeking them and then kind of so organizing a base night. So if we're thinking, okay, this is going to be an electronic night. Who do we know who's electronic? Who do they know that might be interested? Is there anyone else who might be interested? And kind of lots and lots of, hey, we might have this thing coming up. Do you want to jump on this thing? It's very DIY in the outlook. The objective would be to try and get people who are interested in coming through. Another project that's kind of going on at the minute is Rose Astronaut. She's got like her own soundtrack and she's kind of like becoming this different persona. And with the Rose Astronaut stuff, it's kind of very abstract sounding, ambient soundscape. So everything, all of like the film soundtrack influences I've got, that doesn't quite fit into Cyborg, kind of drifts over into the Rose Astronaut music side of things as well. So that's kind of a big, big, big project. Now, clarify this for me. So what you're saying is you, the person who had an album that decided to scrap it and write a new one <laughs> mm -hmm. is putting out a project because it's more stuff that couldn't fit into the project that you already did two albums for only. So, so it's more <laughs> stuff because you had yeah. too much stuff that didn't fit. Am I, am exactly. I, that's yeah. exactly it. Okay. I just don't sleep. It's a that I get to sleep at any point. To help prevent the whole whole album being scrapped again, it can sort of go into that basket a bit more and go, that's in the Rose Astronaut basket. Keep it. Don't scrap it all. Keep it for now. So now it's sort of becoming not really a dumping ground, but kind of a holding pen. <laughs> I love the subtle difference that you put in there for it. So I, I, <laughs> I didn't consider it a dumping ground either. I, I get what you're saying. It's just kind of a thing where, I don't know, it's like a, somebody who writes, but they also, like they write books, but they also have a blog. I mean, they're two different outlets completely. And, Absolutely. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's a different thing. You can check out the new music at cyberwastemusic.com. And if you haven't already... You can subscribe to this podcast at lorenzosmusic.com, where you can also hear our music and download it for free. Next week, I meet a band here in my own city of Madison, Wisconsin, called The Fancy Pairs. I'll talk to you later.